and welcome to Expert Perspectives from the 20th Annual NOCR meeting, meeting once again at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Uh, the meeting finished up just a few minutes ago, and the afternoon session was a lung cancer marathon, uh, almost four hours uh, covering a broad array of topics in non-small cell lung cancer, and that session was chaired by my guest, Dr. Corey Langer from the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center. And Corey, uh, we really covered a tremendous amount of material this afternoon, and, and in 15 or 20 minutes, we can't go over <laughs> all of it. All. But I think there, there were a number of key issues that, that are worth bringing up. Um, number one, I think, is, is the importance of uh, the EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancers. We've had erlotinib. Uh, and gefitinib in, in other parts of the world for a number of years, but resistance has, has become a problem. Um, there are some new irreversible uh, EGFR inhibitors, and then there are some other um, EGFR inhibitors in the pipelines that uh, look like they're going to be even more effective than the first generation. So bring us up to date on, on what was discussed, uh, Dr. Ann So. Uh, presented uh, much of that information today. She did a phenomenal job. Um, I think we've all come to accept uh, the primacy of uh, EGFR TKI and mutant positive non-small cell. Of course, in this country, it's 10 to 15 percent of the overall population. Elsewhere in the world, particularly in East Asia, it's 30, 40, 50 percent of the population. So it's a major issue in the management of advanced uh, disease. And so the, the controversies about first-line treatment have essentially disappeared. For the most part, virtually all of us, if we know a patient has a mutation, we'll treat them up front, first line, with the TKI. Erlotinib has been our go-to uh, standard now. Fatinib has been approved, and there's mm -hmm. some uh, penetration uh, of uh, fatinib in the first line setting. The big issue that comes up and really is uh, ubiquitous is uh, uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, these patients inevitably will develop disease progression, sometimes sooner than later. The median time to progression can be 10, 12, 13 months, depending on which trial. And what to do in that circumstance is unclear. Outside of a clinical trial, the standard is to go to chemotherapy. And if you do that, do you go with chemotherapy alone? Do you continue the EGFR TKI during the chemotherapy? If you do that, do you intercalate it? Do you interrupt it right. to avoid uh, potential antagonism? Or, uh, and if you, the patient does well on the chemotherapy, the, you then transition back to the TKI or perhaps to an alternative TKI. Right. So there are so many options. I think what's potentially quite exciting are two avenues of research. A fatin has been approved, but in the relapse setting, in patients who have developed disease progression, particularly in combination with cetuximab, we are seeing responses in the 30 to 40 percent range. With a fatin and With a fatin and cetuximab, and cetuximab right. together. And um, uh, disease control rates approaching 75, 80 percent. Consequently, there are uh, trials now, uh, uh, both upfront trials looking at a fatinib plus or minus cetuximab, and second line trials in the uh, EGFR uh, mutant relapse setting uh, asking the same question. I think those are crucial. How um, well is that combination tolerated? Because the fatinib has some significant adverse events as well. It's a big concern because you're giving two agents, both of which can cause, uh, both of which are EGFR inhibitors, and both of which can cause rash. So the big concern, of course, is that the rash may be exacerbated. But you've got to remember that these patients have already been on a TKI, and they've sort of developed a tolerance, uh, in some cases, tachyphylaxis to the rash. The rash is dissipated or it's under control. And at least anecdotally, in my experience, when I've treated patients with a fatinib after erlotinib, I haven't seen much of that exacerbation. Good to know. The combination, you do see some heightened rash. I think perhaps of even more uh, import and excitement are these second generation um, uh, inhibitors that focus on T790, which is probably the mechanism of resistance in 55 to 60 percent of right. all those who develop resistance. And the drugs don't have names yet, but AstraZeneca and Clovis Pharmaceutical are developing these agents. They're oral. They seem to be less toxic mm -hmm. than the uh, standard EGFR and, TKIs. And they less don't target the wild type. Correct. So uh, less rash, less diarrhea. In fact, uh, the uh, experts who've actually uh, had experience with these agents have been uh, quite impressed by the lack of uh, side effects when they've uh, instituted these agents. Single agents um, actually causing responses, in some cases profound responses, 
in patients who have progressed not just on a TKI front, but also several have progressed on chemotherapy and afatinib and cetuximab. And I have uh, personally re uh, referred patients for these trials and have been uh, favorably impressed with uh, some of the responses I've seen. Very good. And Ed made uh, quite a point of differentiating oligometastatic disease from more globally progressive disease on, on erlotinib or on first generation TKIs. This is a big uh, issue and it, it crosses all of the TKIs, all of the targeted therapies. I think the, the same principle applies. So if a patient develops uh, uh, isolated progression or oligo progression and is otherwise doing well and has continued to respond at the original sites of the tumor, um, it makes sense to selectively treat the oligo progression but not abandon the agent that's gotten them to that point. And I think uh, that applies to erlotinib and EGFR mutant and it applies equally well to crisotinib in uh, ALK positive patients. The brain in particular seems to be a sanctuary site. A fair number of these patients develop uh, brain metastases. If uh, uh, there's uh, symptoms or vasogenic edema, of course you need to give them either radiation or uh, stereotactic uh, therapy. Here there's a difference. With the EGFR inhibitors, you, uh, it's not clear that second generation will necessarily penetrate the brain. On the other hand, with ALK positive patients whose disease progresses on a crisotinib, and uh, they are manifesting uh, CNS progression, um, all, all three of the agents, electinib, the uh, ARIA drug AP2613, and now um, Zakirinib, uh, the LDK, the LDK uh, compound, the all seem to have activity uh, in CNS metastases. Right. So in a patient who does not have symptoms, who doesn't have much in the way of vasogenic edema, we are making that leap from first uh, line uh, crisotinib TKI to second line without necessarily uh, radiating the brain. So mechanisms of resistance to Crisotinib, uh, do we know much about that um, yet? There have been some uh, early studies. Uh, Bob Dobley uh, from the uh, University of Colorado has looked at this and seems to be all over the ballpark. There are some ALK mutations, some amplification. Intriguingly, some of these patients seem to harbor both KRAS and EGFR uh, mutations, which raises the whole issue of another clone uh, because uh, baseline EGFR and ALK are virtually always uh, mutually exclusive. And certainly you could act on that as an EGFR mutant is uh, a mutation is what you're finding. Uh, you would probably preferentially switch to uh, uh, an EGFR TKI as opposed to a second generation ALK inhibitor. But that's still very early uh, fledgling research. And outside of a clinical trial, um, we're uh, not necessarily doing that off study. The other point that I'd forgotten that, that Anne so made in, um, in patients who progress on first generation uh, EGFR targeted TKIs was that there is a significant percent, maybe five to seven percent, who develop a small cell lung cancer yeah. uh, type of phenotype, and that these patients need to be treated with cisatopicide. <coughs> the original reports uh, cited even a higher percentage, 10 to 13 percent. That's dropped now to five to seven percent. I think the real number may be closer to three or four percent, but certainly in a patient who seems to be developing fulminant progression is otherwise doing reasonably well, it's mandatory that you biopsy that individual and uh, make sure that the small cell is not uh, the new histology. And she is, uh, she, in her experience, she uh, mentioned three patients in her practice that she's treated with atopicide uh, platinum. I have biopsied uh, many of these patients, and at least to date, I've not yet seen the small cell well, transformation. Leisha Sequest uh, from Dana-Farber told me that she has had patients who progress in a small cell pattern and then later progress back in an EGFR yes. mutant pattern. So there's a real migration between gene expressions. And um, intriguingly, uh, most of these patients retain their EGFR mutation. So right. if they've done well small cell therapy, they go back on the TKI, perhaps a different TKI, but at least continuing the uh, TKI uh, uh, either without break or with some interruption. So Ronnie Mira, who uh, discussed the EML4 ALK fusions, also talked about ros a less common uh, fusion, uh, but one that's also targeted by crisotinib. So do these uh, next generation uh, EML4 ALK inhibitors all target ROS1? We think they do, but we don't know for sure. The, all the data so far are really with crisotinib. So, uh, um, Many of the studies are including uh, cohorts that are ROS1 positive, but they're not that common. They're only 1 to 2% of the entire uh, 
advanced uh, adenocarcinoma population. Phenotypically, ROS1, ALK, and EGFR are all very similar, They're almost exclusively adenocarcinoma. The vast majority are never smokers or minimal uh, remote former smokers. Um, there are some histologic differences. Uh, ALK uh, is associated with signet ring morphology and probably a higher percentage of males uh, with ALK or ROS mm -hmm. compared to EGFR. Uh, but uh, the data is still very early. The number of patients with ROS1 that have been treated with uh, ALK inhibitor is probably number less than 100. The other um, mechanism of resistance that, that has been discussed with uh, progression on, on EGFR TKIs is that of uh, CMET amplification mm -hmm. or, or overexpression. I guess mutations are not that common, um, and it sounds like the percentage of resistance that's due to CMET is lower than originally thought, but there are TKIs and monoclonal antibodies that are being looked at to target either the, the ligand, hepatocyte growth factor, or the receptor itself. The original percentages cited for uh, MET amplification and uh, the setting of EGFR resistance was about 20 percent. I think that's dropped now to about 5 to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. Certainly T790 predominates. Um, there are a number of TKIs. Tavantinib is one example, though it was not tested specifically in EGFR mutants. It was looked at uh, in combination with erlotinib right. in a broader population of wild-type individuals, including KRAS mutants, and um, showed a putative benefit, in, um, uh, particularly in uh, non-squamous and intriguingly in KRAS mutants, a group you wouldn't ordinarily treat mm -hmm. with erlotinib as a single agent. So that laid the groundwork for the Marquis trial, big phase three of erlotinib with or without tavantinib was placebo-controlled, randomized prospective effort, which unfortunately failed to show a survival right. advantage. But the important um, sidebar to that trial, and really to virtually all of the CMET trials, those who had heightened expression or amplification or some mm -hmm. abnormality of CMET seemed to have a differential preferential uh, response and perhaps a, a tendency towards survival benefit, if not an absolute survival benefit. So I, I, I guess I'm an et eternal optimist. I would argue those studies need to be redone specifically in that right. group. Onartuzumab, one-arm antibody that targets uh, MET, is being actively investigated in the same setting, again, outside of an EGFR mutant uh, population, uh, essentially wild type. In a randomized phase two, um, erlotinib with or without onartuzumab really showed no major difference, but when we looked at CMET expression, and this was strictly IHC, uh, those who had high levels seemed to have a major benefit, and those who had low levels actually did better yeah. with uh, erlotinib alone. So um, a phase three trial uh, isolating the role of onartuzumab in this setting has been uh, mounted, it's completed accrual, it's a big trial. Uh, I don't know the actual accrual numbers, but it's a, a close, I believe it's close to 1,000. And rumor has it, if there are enough events, it may actually be reported out this year, 2014 at ASCO. At ASCO, so it'll be very interesting. Well, there was quite a bit of discussion this afternoon about what specific mutations, fusions, whatever, one should look for in a newly diagnosed non-small cell lung cancer, especially if it's a non-smoker. So do you just look for EGFR, and if that's wild type, go on and look for ROS1, and if that's wild type, or, or EML4, or, ROS1, yeah. Yeah. Or, or do you just do a panel and look at everything? I think the most efficient approach is to do a panel. Um, tissue is limited. Uh, there's a major risk of depleting that tissue if uh, you do sequential testing. Right. Uh, most of the panels now can be reported out within 10 to 14 days. They include the actionable um, molecular abnormalities, so EGFR mutations as well as fusion proteins of ALK and ROS1, and potentially actionable abnormalities, including KRAS and increasingly HER2, uh, BRAF, which are right. present about as often as uh, ROS1. Uh, there are already FDA-approved drugs and other diseases that can target HER2 and uh, BRAF. And KRAS is a focus of major research. Ronnie Mara okay. today Mech reviewed uh, um, the uh, early MEK inhibitor trials, including the um, phase, uh, randomized phase two of docetaxel with or without uh, selumetinib, uh, which showed uh, uh, promising PFS and overall survival. It was a small study, fewer than 100 patients, but uh, uh, more than doubling in PFS and about a three and a half, four month difference in survival. 
Again, it was underpowered trial, so the survival wasn't significant, but certainly enough data and enough lead to suggest that once we iron out the toxicities, which are substantial, we probably need to get going at the phase three. In the so I know that in, in <coughs> KRAS mutant, uh, there's a lot of work looking at the role of, of MEK inhibitors, but in melanoma, which is BRAF mutant, um, there's strong evidence to suggest that the combination of BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors is more effective than just BRAF inhibitors alone. Are, are combinations being looked at? In, uh, in KRAS mutant non-small cell lung cancer? I'm not aware of targeted combinations yet, although I'm sure they're probably being looked at in phase one. For BRAF, uh, there was a, we didn't discuss it at this meeting, but at this year's ASCO, there was a study of Dubrafenib from the French mm -hmm. that showed response rates on par with what you'd observe in melanoma, about 40, 45 percent, disease control rates of 60 percent or so. Uh, again, this is relatively rare, unlike melanoma where it's 40, 45 yeah, percent yeah. of the population. Even We're talking more, about yeah. one and a half, two percent right. of the uh, adenocarcinoma population. Phenotypically very similar to KRAS. Uh, usually adenocarcinoma are much more likely to be smokers and frequently heavy, heavy smokers. And um, so I am not yet aware, at least in non-small cell, of formal prospective trials uh, combining BRAF inhibitors with the MEK inhibitors. I'm sure they're coming. So an amazing number of new targets and new agents being discovered in adenocarcinoma. I assume it's exactly the same in squamous cell. I wish it were. <laughs> <laughs> squamous, unfortunately, has become almost an orphan entity. Um, we have not made very much progress in the last decade or so. When we look at the adenocarcinoma pie, it's being sliced up repeatedly, and at this point, Probably 60% or more of patients have an actionable target or a potentially actionable uh, target. In squamous, that pie has barely been touched. Now, increasingly, we are recognizing abnormalities that seem to be specific to squamous. So um, fibroblast growth factor receptor ampl amplification, about a quarter of patients. We're seeing PIC kinase and P10 mutations, P10 loss. And you add it all up, it comes to about 50%. But the studies targeting these abnormalities <coughs> these uh, mm -hmm. studies are very early. Right. Uh, they're fledgling. They're really in phase one. But intriguingly, anecdotally, there have been reports of responses with some of these agents, frequently in heavily pretreated uh, individuals. So I, the NCI and the cooperative groups have recognized our deficiencies in squamous cell research and uh, put together a very important master protocol where uh, patients in the second line setting. Uh, will have their uh, tumor sequence uh, specific uh, driver abnormalities are not necessarily mm -hmm. mutations and the amplifications are identified. There is some overlap. And then patients will be randomized to a standard second line agent. In squamous, it's either docetaxel or um, gemcitabine. Pemetrexid obviously right. doesn't have a role. Versus new, the new agents targeting mm -hmm. these abnormalities. In some cases, the new agents alone. In some cases, combination of chemotherapy and the new agent. Those who do not have a putative uh, biomarker will um, most likely get one of the new um, PD-1 inhibitors, one of the new checkpoint inhibitors. I think this is the best way to proceed with squamous cell. Mm -hmm. uh, in rapid sequence, we can look at many different agents, all with a common control arm. Um, obviously, different companies have different interests in these agents, but they're never comparing the agents to each other. They're always comparing it to a common control arm, so we never run that risk. And uh, if something shows activity, then it'll be explored further in phase two and perhaps uh, ultimately in randomized phase three. In the <coughs> NAB pap paclitaxel, which is looked, that seems to be somewhat more effective in squamous mm -hmm. uh, than in an adeno, so that's an option. And then the Immune checkpoint inhibitors also seem to work at least as well in squamous. So beyond as the animal. targeted uh, agents, there are glimmers of hope. Uh, remember back to the Scagliotti trial that compared PEM to gemcitabine mm -hmm. in combination with cisplatin. He hypothesized that low levels of TS would correlate with sensitivity to pemetrexin, and he was right. He did not hypothesize that uh, gemcitabine would have a preferential benefit in the squamous population. In fact, it did. Gem was clearly superior to PEM, and that's sort of, in many cases, been our go-to regimen. NAB paclitaxel has shown promise, uh, a weekly regimen uh, without interruption in combination with carbo, showed a much higher response rate, at least, compared to standard 
history week pack card, but it didn't translate into a PFS for overall survival benefit, but at least amongst the elderly, which included both adeno and squamous, we see a putative uh, survival improvement of about nine months that definitely needs to be explored further. The early reports of the PD-1 inhibitors suggested a preferential benefit in the squamous cell population. That's small and numbers. Small numbers, and as time has gone on, they look about equal. But if you go back to ipilimumab, which of course is approved in melanoma, but has also been looked at in non-small cell, um, randomized phase two that, uh, two that looked at chemo alone or chemo plus ipi, uh, suggested, uh, particularly in the squamous cell cohort, uh, it's a phased approach, sort of delaying the uh, IPI until cycle three, that uh, you might see a survival benefit. Uh, and the randomized phase two is about three, three and a half months. And that has set the stage for a uh, major ongoing phase three trial comparing chemo alone to chemo plus ipilimumab. And finally, the EGFR monoclonal antibody, cetuximab, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in combination with chemo, look better than chemo alone, both in adeno and squamous. Mm -hmm. And when you apply IHC assessment, look at H scores, the measure of the intensity of staining. Those who had higher H scores had a relatively greater benefit, and that benefit was even more pronounced in the squamous population. So uh, recent data uh, from uh, Lilly from, uh, looking at nesetumab, which is second generation EGFR monoclonal antibody, um, was recently reported as positive in combination and with We'll Jamis hear about Latin. that at ASCO. I'm sure that's coming to ASCO. Uh, Details await us. Uh, the big question, is it going to be positive statistically but not clinically meaningful, or will it be both clinically meaningful and statistically significant? Well, one of the most interesting comments of the meeting, I think from actually yesterday during the immunotherapy session, Scott Gettinger said that he had treated over 100 patients, non-small cell patients, with uh, <coughs> anti-PD-1, PD-L1 antibodies, and they were just extremely well tolerated. The patients really didn't realize that they were getting anything. That they, they I've had a similar experience. Now, I, I haven't quite had the breadth of uh, Scott's experience, but we've been focusing on the Merck uh, PD-1 uh, antibody. And by and large, uh, certainly as a single agent, these agents, these drugs are very well tolerated. Um, also, the putative marker for this PD-L1 is not a, uh, a binary marker. Those who uh, have expression of PDL1 are probably more likely to respond, but those who lack expression, responses still occur. And anecdotally, I have a patient uh, with advanced squamous cell, heavily pretreated, pretty much exhausted standard chemotherapy, but also received quite a bit of radiation to his chest. We were out of standard uh, therapies. Uh, we were really looking at phase one, still had a good performance status. I managed to get the last slot for the PDL1 negative co uh, cohort mm -hmm. in this study, and he was responding beautifully. In fact, he's so had a more profound response. Either PDL1 isn't that good a biomarker, or the assay isn't perfect. Both, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need a, a, a much better biomarker, or perhaps a combination of markers. Very good. But I'm worried about studies that are uh, empirically excluding PDL1 yeah. negative, and I think yeah. that may be premature. Absolutely. Well, Corey. Thank you so much. This is always fun to sit down and, and talk to you. And it was a great session this afternoon. And well, you kept everyone on time, which is really good. <laughs> and so we appreciate that. So we'll look forward to doing this again next year. Appreciate it. All Thank right. You. And thanks to all of you for watching this session of Expert Perspectives from the 20th Annual NOCR Meeting in Las Vegas. Thanks again.